Good evening and welcome to the 2020 Walton Lecture on Science and Religion. My name is Peter van der Voort and I'm chairing the Committee of Christians in Science Ireland, which is organizing the Walton Lectures. We are a local group of Christians in Science based in the United Kingdom and Ireland. On your screen beside me is Professor Catherine Hayhoe, who will give the 2020 Walton Lecture shortly. Before I introduce Professor Hayhoe, I want to say a few words about the Walton Lectures. These lectures are named after Ernest Walton, who was Professor of Physics at Trinity College, Dublin. Ernest Walton shared the 1951 Nobel Prize in Physics mm. with John Cockcroft for the pioneering nuclear physics experiments they did at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge University. Walton was a long time member of the Methodist Church and following the award of the Nobel Prize, he spoke on science and religion in various locations. At this point, we want to acknowledge Marion and Derek Woods in Belfast. Marion is Walton's daughter, and on behalf of the Walton family, she has agreed that we could use Walton's name for these lectures. We're delighted that Professor Catherine Hayhoe has agreed to give the 2020 Walton lectures on the topic of climate change. She traveled to Ireland in March of this year and gave a Walton lecture at University College Cork, but her second lecture at Minute University had to be canceled because of the closure of universities in relation to COVID-19. So she will now give this lecture online. Professor Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist and director of the Climate Science Center at Texas Tech University in Lubbock in Texas. She specializes in climate impact assessments and in translating climate projections into actionable information. She has been a lead contributor to the United States National Climate Assessments. Professor Hayhoe is also a renowned science communicator and an evangelical Christian who is fearless to speak about climate change. Her message is, the climate is changing, it is human caused, the impacts are serious and it is time to act. The title of our lecture today is Climate Change, Facts, Fictions and Our Faith. Thank you, Peter. It's a great pleasure to be able to be with you here virtually. Originally, this lecture was scheduled for the middle of March, and it was literally the day that the country shut down. As a result, what I have to say has changed substantially. I'm not going to talk as much about the science of climate change, though if you want more, I certainly have many lectures that have already been recorded on that topic. Instead, I want to talk about what we're what is on all of our minds today, which is not only climate science, Christians, and our culture, but another word that also begins with C. And that, of course, is coronavirus. This is going to be interactive. So we are going to get started here. I will go ahead and share my screen. We are going to get started here with uh, a way for you to talk to me as well as a way for me to talk to you. So on your phone or your computer or your laptop or your tablet or your iPad, whatever you're on, or if you have your phone in your hand, you can do this too, go to pollev.com slash Catherine. That link should also be in the comments if you just want to click, click on it. And when you do go there to pollev.com slash my name with two A's, it might ask you for your name, but you don't have to put your name and you can just put skip and then anonymous is fine. And then you will see a map that asks, where are you joining us from? Now, I realize this map is only focused over Ireland and the United Kingdom. So if you are joining us from North America, then just click on the map off to the left. If you are joining us from Europe, just click on the map off to the right. And of course, if you are from somewhere to the south of this map, just click off down to the south. So if we see somebody coming, uh, for, you know, if we see somebody who's, who's clicked on the blue area, we will know that that means that you're not on a boat, you're just off in that direction. All right, it looks like we have a few people from around Dublin, Belfast. We've got somebody over here in North America. Good. And it looks like everybody else is still figuring it out a little bit. Oh, there we got somebody in the middle of Northern Ireland. Excellent. I know it's a little bit difficult to be so precise with your fingers or with your mouse, depending on where you click. All right, it looks like we have most people listening from either around Dublin and Belfast with a few, oh, we have somebody from Cork and, oh, somebody from Cardiff, excellent. Somebody who appears to be in the English Channel, but we'll take that as maybe being down in France. And 
a few others from other places in the world. Excellent. Okay, so now you know how this works. And at the very end, we are going to be taking questions using Poll EV. So, so don't close it out, we'll be using it. And at the end, you'll be able to write in whatever question you might have for me. And here's the fun part, you can actually upvote the questions of other people. So Peter and I probably won't have time to get to all the questions, but you can upvote the questions that you most want us to answer at the very end. So save your questions till then, and this is the way that you're going to be putting them in. All right. So climate change, Christianity, our culture, and coronavirus. This last C word is really the one that is on most of our minds, especially today. We know that coronavirus is devastating the economy. This past summer, the Central Bank of Ireland warned that the outlook for Ireland's economy was very uncertain. It's estimated that between April and June, 400 million full-time jobs were lost around the world. Income dropped by 10%, equivalent to $3.5 million US. In North America, there's been many articles about how women are leaving the workforce in increasing numbers compared to men. We're also seeing devastating stories about how coronavirus is increasing inequality. It's fueling more conflict, more poverty, more starvation. It's pushed millions more children deeper into poverty. A new study that just came out four or five weeks ago found 150 million more children. COVID is causing untold suffering and death. These are the latest statistics for Ireland. On the left-hand side, daily confirmed cases in blue and deaths in red. And on the right-hand side, the total are cumulative cases and deaths. Just over 60,000 cases now. I live in a town that has about 250,000 people. It's called Lubbock and it's in West Texas. And our numbers are not that different. This is what our new cases look like. Yesterday, we hit almost 700 new cases in one day in a city of, of 250,000 people. Last week, we had a funeral for a woman in our church. I'm sure you know many people who have had this. I do too, members of my family, colleagues, and more. So at this point, you may be thinking, how can we even think about climate change when there is so much other suffering going on around the world? Why are you having a lecture on climate change of all things? And the reason why is because we often think of it like this. We think, I have a priority list. And right now at the top of my priority list is surviving COVID and its effects on our lives, our economy, shutdowns, lockdowns, and more. Worrying about people who I love, feeding my family, keeping up with my job, or even just keeping my job paying the bills, planning for the future, and then way down here at the bottom, maybe 29, 32, or 65, we might have doing something about climate change. And here we have a whole lecture that's gonna be telling me that I need to do something about climate change, that I need to move it further up my priority list. But my priority list is already full of things that I'm overwhelmed with that I can't even manage today. How am I gonna cope with one more thing? Now, let me ask you, this is a question for you. Has this ever occurred to you? Is this the first time that you've thought of this? Or have you already thought a few times, how on earth can I worry about climate change considering the state that the world is in today? Or is this a thought that occurs to you frequently? All right. It looks like we got a few votes in and a few people say frequently, yes. I'm glad you say that because it occurs to me frequently too. That was my answer. And that is why I'm giving a very different talk than I would have given six months ago. We've got, okay, it's almost 50-50. Oh no, it's going down a little bit, 60-40 now. But it's never occurred to nobody. You've thought of it at least a few times, if not frequently, and I completely agree. Here's the thing though. I personally could not care less about how much the planet is warming. Now you might say, wait a second, aren't you a climate scientist? Isn't that what you're supposed to care about? If the only consequence of fueling our economy based on fossil fuels since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, if the only consequence of that choice was a one, two, three, or even four degree increase in global average temperature and nothing else, I wouldn't care at all. 
but it isn't. The reason I care about climate change is because, not because it affects the temperature of the planet, but because the increase in the temperature of the planet and other consequences of increasing carbon dioxide levels and digging up and burning fossil fuels, it's because they affect our health. They affect everyone I love. They affect the food that we eat. They affect my job, the economy, and my ability to pay the bills, planning for the future. Do you notice the parallels here? The only reason that I care about climate change is because it already affects everything else that is at the top of my priority list today. In fact, I don't think climate change should even be on our priority list at all. The only reason we care about it is because it is, as the U.S. military calls it, a threat multiplier. It takes all of the other issues that we are already so worried about today, and it makes them worse. So I don't have to move climate change up my priority list from 65 or 32 or 29 to maybe number 10 or 9 or maybe even 8. No, it isn't even on my priority list at all because I care about it because of what is already number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 on that list today. This cartoon, I think, perfectly summarizes it. You may have seen it, you may not have seen it, but it's a series of tidal waves or tsunamis. We've got COVID, we've got the economic recession rearing behind it, and behind it, we have climate change. So it isn't a case of causing ourselves or trying to force ourselves to care more about it. We absolutely already care about it. We just often haven't connected the dots. And in fact, there are many, many parallels between the seas, coronavirus and climate change. Climate change is already and will continue to devastating the economy. This recent headline, think the COVID catastrophe is expensive? The climate catastrophe could cost a quadrillion dollars globally. What about inequality? This study that came out last year found that climate change from 1960 to 2010 had already increased the gap between the richest and poorest countries by as much as 25%. You can see that countries like Ireland, the UK, my home, Canada, their GDP has actually increased a little bit over that time. But the GDP of the poorest countries in the world, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, even India, they've decreased. And fossil fuels and climate change are already causing untold suffering and even death. Did you know that air pollution alone is responsible for nearly 9 million excess premature deaths around the world? Here in the United States, coronavirus has led to almost 250,000 deaths. But over 200,000 people in the United States die from air pollution every single year, every year. So yes, coronavirus absolutely causes death and suffering, but climate change and fossil fuel use does too. Some of it happens in the places where we live, where we use the fossil fuels, but some of it we export to other countries. I grew up part of my life as a child in Colombia. And it turns out that mines in northern Colombia, which is a very underdeveloped indigenous area, those mines supply much of Ireland's coal. And so as political scientist Noel Healy writes in this, in this piece, he talks about the human rights violations. He talks about the fact that these mines use up all the water and leave the local villages with nothing. He talks about the injustices that are visited upon people who already have very little by our extraction and consumption of fossil fuels. This is true with indigenous peoples in my home country of Canada, and it is also unfortunately true with Ireland as well. Then there's the fact that there's a link between climate change and coronavirus. Part of that link relates to air pollution. So digging up and burning coal and then oil and natural gas produces air pollution as well as heat trapping gases. The heat trapping gases drive climate change. 
The warmer it is, the more air pollution we get because the chemical reactions that take our tailpipe emissions and turn them into ground level ozone happen faster when it's warmer. So there's already a feedback effect between fossil fuels, climate change, and air pollution. But what they originally found from studying SARS a number of years ago, remember SARS? And then now they've confirmed from studying coronavirus today is that people who are already poor, who are already marginalized, who already live in places where air pollution is poor and they can't afford to live somewhere better, their lungs are already so damaged by that air pollution, whether they live in China or Chicago, that when they're exposed to the coronavirus, they're much more likely to get COVID. When they get COVID, they're much more likely to become seriously ill and even die of it. So for example, in the city of Chicago in the US, 30% of their population is black, but 70% of the COVID deaths are among the African-American population. And there's strong suggestions that the reason why is because of this disproportionate exposure to long-term air pollution. And then of course, we've got the fact that climate change is changing and altering animal habitats. We're destroying habitats, but climate change is alter also altering the food that animals eat and even where animals themselves can live. And so climate change is causing one of the greatest migrations and one of the fastest migrations in animal, plant, insect, bird species that we've known. And because of that, some experts believe that it's increasing the risk of what? Of zoonosis, which is the process by which viruses jump from animal to human populations, and that's how we got coronavirus. It's not just on the one side though, it's also on the other. As this prescient article wrote in March, just a few days after I, I got back from Ireland, coronavirus could hold some key lessons on how we fight climate change. Could we lower our emissions? Could we change the way that we live? Could we take swift action to avoid costly impacts? And some countries say yes. Here's the thing. We know that the lockdown actually temporarily dropped carbon emissions. They dropped 25% in China in February, and globally in April, they dropped almost 20%. Now, here's the thing. The carbon emissions shot right back up again as soon as all the lockdowns eased. Some lockdowns are going into effect now. So, for example, in France and Germany, they might go down a little bit, but they'll go right back up again. So there's no long-term benefit to climate ch change because of the lockdowns. But here's the fascinating thing. You know the Paris Agreement. You know that it requires us to cut our emissions about 40 to 50% by 2030 in rich countries and to become carbon neutral by 2050. If the emission reductions that we achieved through the lockdowns have been achieved through true climate solutions, increasing efficiency, switching to clean energy, then the impact on climate would have been enormous. How big? Well, according to the IPCC, again, we have to reduce our carbon emissions about 40 to 50 percent by 2030 and to near carbon zero neutral by 2050. If the changes we saw this past spring had been permanent, we would have been halfway to our 1.5 degree goal in just a few weeks. Let that sink in. If our carbon emission reductions due to the lockdown had been permanent, which they couldn't be because they were achieved through unsustainable methods like shutting down industry, shutting down schools, not letting people travel anywhere. If they had been achieved through efficiency and clean energy and smart agricultural practices, we would have been halfway to our Paris goal by 2030 in just a matter of weeks. And that shows us that swift action is possible and it can make a difference. So what's happening now? Well, what's happening is many cities and many countries are actually planning for a green recovery. They know that the future can be different than the past. And this horrible pandemic is actually a chance to push a reset button on many of the ways that we've just taken for granted that we have to live that we really don't have to live anymore. So, for example, in Bristol, they're fast-tracking plans to make large parts of the city center pedestrian. Milan is reducing its car use as well. In my home country of Canada, companies are going to have to disclose the impacts of their activities on climate in order to get economic aid from the government. 
In France, Air France has to cut its carbon emissions 50% to get a government bailout. And Carbon Brief, which is an excellent resource if you haven't heard of it before, Carbon Brief uh, actually has a list that they track and regularly update of all the green recovery plans around the world. So not only is climate change potentially exacerbating the impacts of coronavirus on us, but it could go the other way where our recovery offers a chance to also act on climate. And that's good news because climate action is action for the health of the planet and for the human race. Climate change and coronavirus are both all about our health. And who doesn't care about that? So both climate change and COVID threaten the health and the safety of our families, our friends, our loved ones, our communities, and our countries. Both of them affect the economy, resource availability, national security, and more. Both disproportionately affect the sick, the young, the old, the poorest, and the most vulnerable, both here and abroad. Both of them are, as the military calls it again, a threat multiplier, taking the fault lines that already fragment our society and deepening and broadening them even further. So at this point, you may be thinking, okay, so how do I react to this? And this is where our values come in. And for many of us who are Christians, our values are informed by our faith. We care about both of these issues because of who we are. Who are we? We're humans. And for many of us, we're Christians too. So now I want to turn to a Christian perspective on the planet we live on, on the animals and the ecosystems that inhabit it, that are intimately interwoven with our risk of being exposed to diseases like coronavirus, and our perspective on people. If you ask any child, who goes to Sunday school, what is God's greatest gift? They'll always say, oh, well, I know it was his son. But I don't know about you, but I've never heard a sermon or a talk or read an essay written about God's second greatest gift. Now we could argue over what that second greatest gift is, but let me propose one to you. Our planet that gives us the physical life that sustains us. We humans cannot float around in outer space without the resources that our planet gives us. It gives us the air that we breathe. Take a breath right now. That comes from our planet. It gives you the water that you drink. It gives us the food we eat. It gives us the materials we use to make everything that we have. And our planet gives us beauty too that feeds our soul. It isn't just about our physical needs. It's about the grandeur of this planet as well. So in the Bible, in the very beginning of Genesis, chapter 1, God says, let us make human beings in our image, reflecting our nature. And this is a verse that you're probably familiar with if, you, if you've grown up going to church. But I don't know about you, but it always stopped there. I never really clued into the next two words, so that. There's a reason. Why? So that they can Rada, that's the Hebrew word, every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. Now, this word Rada has often been interpreted as dominion or rule over. And people use that in the Christian world literally as an excuse to extract everything of value from the earth, irregardless of the cost to the planet, to every living thing on this planet, to other humans around that. And they say, oh, well, when we're all done, we can just push the eject button. This is a mindset that is endemic throughout the North American Christian world. And I say with great sorrow that I see this spreading to Ireland, the UK, Europe, Canada, and beyond. But is that really what Rada means? So rather than translating this, I want to look at other verses where they use the same word. Like in Psalm 72, where it talks about mehi rada from sea to sea, to what? What is the purpose of this? To deliver the needy, to help those who have no helper, to have compassion on the poor and needy, and the lives of the needy he will save. So what role do we have over every living thing on this planet to deliver the needy, to help those who have no helper, to have compassion on the poor and needy? This is our response to coronavirus and to climate. 
And then in Matthew, again, this is in Aramaic, but it uses the same word. It says, you observed how the godless, Rada, how quickly a little power goes to their head. That shouldn't be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. So it isn't about lording over people. It's about serving people. And then in Genesis 2, it goes on. It uses two other words. It talks about Abad and Shamar. What does this mean? Well, Abad is generally translated as to serve, and Shamar is to protect or guard or keep, or even to garden, to care for. So this is where the idea of stewardship comes from, that if somebody gave you a beautiful plot of land, and you extracted everything of value from it, and you just left it a crumbling ruin, would you be fulfilling their request to Rada, to Abad, and to Shamarit? No. You would, in fact, be disregarding that request. And in other places, for example, in the Bible, it says it's required that those who have been given something be pr proved faithful to it. So this is where the idea of caring for creation comes from, or creation care, that is the motto of so many organizations that are Protestant, that are Catholic, that are Orthodox, and beyond. And so when we look at what we've done, when we look at the fact that to extract coal, for example, in the Appalachian Mountains, they just cut the top off the mountains. Or to extract oil from the ocean can lead to dreadful oil spills. Or to, uh, to grow cattle, we cut down trees and we burn fossil fuels that pollute the air. All of this has a tremendously detrimental impact on our planet. And the trade, of course, in rare and endangered animals is one of the other things that's thought to contribute to the spread of viruses from animal to human populations, as well as to extinction and devastation. Ironically, in March, WWF Italia put out this report called The Loss of Nature and the Rise of Pandemics. And they talked about how the destruction of natural ecosystems the illegal or uncontrolled trade of wild species and the unhygienic conditions under which wild and domestic species are mixed actually contributes to the chance of viruses passing from animals to humans. And so conserving and maintaining nature and its benefits is what provides essential preservation of what? Of our health and our well-being. Climate change, coronavirus, and the values that we learn as Christians, they all fit together. They're entirely consistent with each other. So we know that all of this is connected. We know the scientific facts telling us how this happened. But as Christians, we know that our response is to care about these things. Our response is not one of ego, that we're at the top of the pile, putting our feet up, so to speak, on everything else that was a living thing on this planet. But as Christians, we also believe that we have a special responsibility. We're not just the exact same as everything else. Maybe, and I can't take any credit for these diagrams. These come from Dave Bookless from Arasha, who many of you may know. Maybe this is more accurate, a theological perspective where we are loving and caring for every living thing on this planet. How different would the coronavirus pandemic look like, look like if we took this seriously? Would we even have a pandemic if we took this seriously? But we can't stop there because often this draws an inappropriate distinction between humans versus other living things. And the fact is we are living and other living things are living. We are all living things. All of us are living things. So it isn't a case of nature or creation being separate from humans. We humans are part of nature. And when we are told to care for every living thing on the, this planet, that includes us too. And as I talked about before, our actions and our choices are harming every living thing on this planet. We know back in March and April what the incredibly blue skies look like in some of the most polluted countries in the world as we stopped burning fossil fuels. Well, those polluted skies carry a tremendous cost that we don't think about. As this study finds from just a few years ago, one in six premature deaths worldwide are caused by pollution. Pollution is the largest environmental cause of disease and premature death in the world today. Nine million premature deaths in 2015, 16% of all deaths worldwide, three times more than from AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. In the most severely affected countries, it's one in four. And then there's the fact that when we burn these fossil fuels, they produce heat-trapping gases 
and those heat trapping gases are responsible for climate change. Our cumulative carbon emissions have built up progressively year by year by year. The European Union, the 28 countries that make up the EU, are responsible for a huge chunk. That's the yellow on the bottom. The United States is responsible for the slightly biggest chunk. It's a little bit bigger than the EU. The rest of Europe is there and China is coming up quickly behind, but it still has a ways to go in terms of its cumulative carbon emissions. So we in North America and you in Europe bear the greatest responsibility for the heat trapping gases that are driving climate change. Why do we care about climate change? The biggest reason we care is not because of the increase in the average temperature of the planet again, it's because climate change is loading the weather dice against us. What do I mean by that? Well, we always have a chance of a flood or a heat wave or a, a hurricane, even a hurricane hitting Ireland. That does and can happen naturally. But as climate changes, it's taking one and another and another of these numbers and turning them into sixes too. So the chance of rolling a six or even a double seven is increasing over time as climate changes. As it's increasing the risk of heavy rain events and floods, it's making hurricanes stronger and they can extend farther north. It's making our drought stronger and our heat waves more intense. Specifically, for example, we're seeing that heavy rainfall and flooding is increasing, and this is happening across the UK as well as across North America and beyond. What else are we seeing? We're seeing that wildfires are burning greater area. In fact, a study just last year found that California's wildfires are five times bigger because of climate change. And of course, the headlines just this last January, if you can remember back to last January, were all about the devastating bushfires in Australia. We see that sea level is rising. Two thirds of the world's biggest cities are within just a few feet or a meter of sea level rise. Hurricanes are becoming much more dangerous. And when these events happen, who is most vulnerable to them? The poorest people in the world. This is a map showing where uh, the poorest people live. What percentage of people in each country live in extreme poverty? Don't blink for just a minute because now I'm gonna show you who's most vulnerable to climate change. Why? Because they already do not have enough. And so when disaster strikes, they are the ones who are disproportionately affected by the impacts of a changing climate. When we get a flood in a rich developed city where we have drainage systems, it is devastating. It does destroy our cars and some of our homes. But when a third of the entire country of Bangladesh is underwater as climate change supersizes the monsoon for the second time in three years, the impacts are orders of magnitude more extreme. When we have a drought in Texas, it causes $12 billion worth of agricultural losses. When the same drought occurs in Syria, on top of a corrupt governmental system, on top of abject poverty, on top of a, a country that's already struggling with an influx of refugees from the Iraqi war, you get the same drought on top of them, like the final straw on a camel's back, and it can tip the country over into widespread civil conflict and even refugee crises. That's why caring about climate change, just like caring about coronavirus, is not somehow antithetical to who people are as Christians. No, in fact, I would say that it's entirely consistent with who we are and who God has made us to be. We are exactly the right type of people to care about it because we're told, for example, to walk in love. How loving is it for God's creation to tear it down and destroy it, to traffic in animals, to reduce their habitat? How loving is it to say, oh, I don't care that you're already poor and you're becoming poorer because of my energy choices. That's not loving at all. This is the Texas translation of the Bible. They print it on road signs, and I'm not kidding about that. But I think here it actually makes its point. That love thy neighbor thing, I meant it, signed God. So why do we care about a changing climate? Because we have been told that we as humans, all of us, were responsible for the welfare of every living thing on this planet. We also care about a changing climate because it exacerbates so many of the risks we already face today. Some of you may be familiar with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
Um, it has no hunger, no poverty, access to good education, uh, basic health care, clean water. And then at number 13 out of 17, they have climate action. Well, similar to the priority list I talked about before, I don't think climate action should be a sustainable development goal at all. Why? Because the only reason we care about climate action is because it affects hunger, poverty, the stability of a country which enables it to offer basic education and health care. It affects clean water. The more floods we have, the more pollutants run off into our water supply. We care about climate change because it takes all the risks we already face today and it makes them worse. And the bottom line is we care about it because it affects real people, especially the poorest and most vulnerable among us. So that brings me to the last question. What are we supposed to do about this? What are we supposed to do about it? Because I'm just one person. I can't change the world single-handedly. And literally, I can't. And you're probably thinking, I can't either. What are we supposed to do? Well, I don't want to start with actions. I want to start with attitude. And our attitude, again, goes back to what we believe. And for those of us who are Christians, a lot of what we believe is based on the Bible. And this verse, when I first started studying climate change and realizing how bad it was, really stood out to me. It comes from the book of Timothy, where the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. So often when we think about or we read the news on coronavirus or climate change, our reaction is fear. But the Bible literally says it's like a litmus test. God has not given us a spirit of fear. What has God given us? God has given us power. Now, that's a bit of an old-fashioned word. What's the modern version? The modern version is to be empowered. If you are empowered or if you empower other people, that means they feel capable of acting. So God has enabled us to act. We are empowered to act rather than being paralyzed or frozen by fear. What else has God given us? Love, to consider other people's needs over our own and other loving things as well. And as a scientist, I have to say the last one's my favorite. God has given us a sound mind. What a great gift that is to make good decisions based on facts and information and data that we find in science that can benefit us all. These are the gifts that we have been given. So how can we use these gifts? We can use these gifts to act lovingly, to find out more about organizations like Tear Fund and Arasha and um, many others who care for those who are affected by the impacts of a changing climate around the world. World Vision even cares about this too and talks about this frequently. We can recognize that part of their vulnerability is the fact that they don't have access to the type of agricultural techniques that we have, to the type of energy that we have. And so part of acting lovingly is not just alleviating, alleviating the impacts of climate change, it's projects that enable people to grow food, to find and process water, to produce energy with resources like the sun and the wind that they have, rather than the fossil fuels that most developing countries don't have. Or if they do, they're being sold outside the country. One of my favorite TED Talks is by my colleague, Catherine Wilkinson. She talks about how educating and empowering women and girls is a climate solution. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. Project Drawdown, which you may be familiar with, documents over 100 comprehensive solutions to climate change, some of which may be very familiar on and offshore wind turbines, solar panels, public transportation, energy efficiency, LED light bulbs, but some of which might surprise you, like biochar, burning agricultural waste at high temperature that separates out the carbon and then plowing it back into the ground where it's a fertilizer, like indigenous peoples in the Amazon have been doing for hundreds of years. It stores the carbon in the ground rather than the air, and we want it in the ground. We don't want it in the air. Clean cook stove projects that enable people to cook their food without having to harvest brush or trees and also improves air quality, which also improves their health. I already mentioned educating women and girls, which lowers the birth rate as well as increasing the quality of their lives. And did you know that if all the food that we produce that food waste decays, producing heat trapping gases. If it were its own country, it would be on an annual basis, the number three biggest emitting country in the world, food waste. In Canada, we throw out more than 40% of our food. I don't know what it is in Ireland, but hopefully it's not quite that large. But some of it just, you know, doesn't get sold. Some of it goes bad. Some of it we just eat, make too much and don't eat it. 
So there's all kinds of organizations to sell food that's past its date or to give you a second harvest of bruised fruit and vegetables. Reducing our food waste is actually something that we can do. We can also act in community. Sometimes that means literally in community. And there's wonderful tools popping up. Unfortunately, this one is just for North America right now. But tools where entire neighborhoods can join or groups like the Girl Guide parents or the parents of, of all the children in a certain grade or your church, they can join together to look at how to reduce their carbon emissions, how to understand what's happening, how to prepare for the impacts of a changing climate. Colby May is a graduate from our university and he has actually created, with his business degree and his divinity degree, he has created a nonprofit consulting company that goes to churches and schools, does an energy audit of their buildings, helps them save money and reduce their carbon footprint, and also helps them take further action to install, install or obtain clean energy and support organizations overseas, like other partner with other poor churches or congregations, say in Africa or Southeast Asia, to help them get energy as well. As individuals, though, the number one thing we can do is this. Talk about it. Because it turns out that no matter where you live, in Ireland, in the UK, in Canada, in the United States, we don't really talk about how climate change matters to us, how it's affecting us in the place where we live, and why we care about it because of who we are. So this was not my TED Talk. I encourage you to go watch my TED Talk because it talks more about how important having those conversations are. But I wanna close with one final story that illustrates this. My TED Talk came out in December, 2018. And in March, I was at the London School of Economics giving a talk and afterwards, an older man approached me and he said he'd taken the train into London for the day just to go to my lecture because he had watched my TED Talk five months before and he wanted to let me know what a huge impact it had on his life. So I said, oh, tell me more. And he said, well, because of your TED Talk, I started to have conversations with people in my town. And he lived in a town with, I think, about 150, 160,000 people. He said, I've kept a list of all the conversations I've had. Would you like to see it? Of course, I said, I would love to. So he reached in his bag, and I'll never forget, he pulled out a stack of papers. Now, I was expecting maybe 70 or 80 names. I mean, that's a lot of conversations to have in five months. He had a list of over 10,000 names. And he said, now it's up to 12,000. And he said, because of the conversations he had had, and then others started to have as a result in their town, their city council had just voted to declare a climate emergency, which means that they can then start taking action to reduce their carbon emissions and to prepare for the impacts of a changing climate. That is the power that a single conversation can have, motivated by our values, motivated by our love, empowered, and with a sound mind informing our discussion. The bottom line, I truly believe, is this. Caring about God's creation, the people and other living things that are already being affected by climate change today, if you're a Christian, it's a genuine expression of your faith. It's a faithful acceptance of our responsibility, and it's a true expression of God's love. And no matter who we are, no matter what we believe, we are all, every single one of us, humans. And because we are humans, I believe we have this love for each other, for nature, for every living thing that we share the only home that we have with, our planet. In the words of one of my favorite scientists, Jane Goodall, it is only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony that we can achieve our full potential. And to give the Apostle Paul the final word, the only thing that counts is when our faith expresses itself through love. Thank you so much. When I talk about climate change, I usually end by calling it, it's just about love. It's about loving our global neighbor, whoever they are. You can see many of us here in this little picture. And if you want more information, I would encourage you to head to YouTube where we have a global weirding series. And the two most recent episodes we did cover some of what I talked about with climate change and the coronavirus pandemic. But now what we're going to do is we're going to take your questions and you are going to be able to type in any question you have make it as long as you want. But even if you don't have a question, go ahead and go here, look at the other questions people are asking and upvote the questions that you most want us to answer. All right. Oh, let's bring, okay, there we go. Let's bring Peter on here. Okay, Peter, do you have a question or two to start us off with? 
Yes, I do actually. The, the, <clears throat> the first, I want to start with the com uh, command in the first place. I, uh, you gave us an absolutely fantastic talk, but what I think is hugely important is that we see the interconnectedness of all things. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that even purely from a scientific point of view, we're now talking about Earth system science. Mm -hmm. We see the, the very strong interconnectedness of the, the living world with, with, with the, the, the physical environment of the Earth. And mm -hmm. uh, this is really something that has developed in the last 10, 20 years, I think. And mm -hmm. You've highlighted a number of points on this, and of course, climate change squarely fits within that. And uh, so, I'm immensely excited about the perspective that you uh, that you have. I have one particular question, which is a very specific question from a Christian point of view. And mm -hmm. the we believe, and the Bible gives us indications that God is going to come back, and that things in this world aren't the way they're supposed to be and God is going to make things better and this is what in Christian circles is called eschatology. Mm -hmm. What I'm struggling with personally is that there are quite a few different viewpoints with regard to eschatology mm -hmm. and I find myself wondering whether there are Christians who are listening to this who are saying well look this is all good and fine but God is going to come back, and we think it might be rather sooner rather than later. Is this maybe uh, too much just uh, a wasted effort? Should we just uh, spread the Christian message rather than worry about the, uh, about, about the environment? Mm -hmm. I would say, Peter, that you just put your finger on one of the most cons all over the world. And in fact, I grew up Plymouth Brethren, and those of you who know a little bit of your religious history know that J.N. Darby, who founded the Plymouth Brethren denomination, was the original dispensationalist. He was the one who really popularized the ideas that there's these different dispensations that feeds the eschatological um, theology of today. And of course, it was magnified and amplified by all of the uh, emphasis on prophecy books and the Left Behind series and things in the 1970s when many of us grew up. So it's a very common question for people to ask, why does this even matter? And of course, even from a scientific perspective, eventually the sun in its evolution will grow so big that it, first of all, will boil off all the water on the earth and then eventually envelop it. So we know from a scientific perspective that the earth is eventually going away, although that's a very long time in the future. But when people ask that question, they're actually ignoring just about everything that it says in the New Testament about how we are to behave. And humans being humans, even 2000 years ago, they were thinking the same thing. In fact, in the church in Thessalonica that Paul was writing to in the book of Thessalonians, there were people who were basically saying, oh, well, I think that Christ will return soon, so I'll just quit my job and I will just sit back and I will just wait for the end of the world because they felt like the end of the world was coming very soon at that time. And so the apostle Paul wrote to them and said to them very sternly in a, in a nutshell, not a direct quote, but in a nutshell, get a job feed your family, care for the widows and the orphans, because you don't know the day or the time. And so in the meantime, as he said elsewhere, we are called to walk in the good works that were prepared for us in advance. And those good works include taking care of physical needs. There's another verse that says, you know, if your child, if someone is hungry, will you give them a stone? So, so that the model of people going out and spreading the gospel and then saying, I know you're hungry, I know you're starving, but here, have a Bible. People can't stop to read the Bible if they are hungry, if their children are starving, if they can't feed them, if there's no way that they can grow their food, if they can't even read because they don't have basic, basic education, if they have no health care services. So we know that being the, the hands and the feet of God in the world is an essential part of who we are and who we are called to be. And so when people bring that argument up, I find the most effective response is a response from the same faith-based perspective saying, no matter when or where you think the world is gonna end, and frankly, I don't think it matters because none of us knows anyways, no matter where or when, we know that we're called to live in the present. And in the present, we are called to love others. And in fact, that is how we are supposed to be recognized by others. And frankly, how have we failed at that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly an area that I'm, I'm strongly struggling with. The, uh, I was uh, I was expo exposed. I went to uh, 
some Bible study through Brethren Church. And I yeah. still have to say, have big question marks with regard to their interpretive system, especially with regard to eschatology. And I'm also mm -hmm. a bit staggered about the different viewpoints that there are in Christian circles. There's really, the, the viewpoints are quite different. And mm -hmm. for me, another question that remains is if the Bible says that God is going to create a new heavens and a new earth, is that going to evolve a, involve a renewal of our present creation? And it, it, it seems to me that we better better be very careful about that. And um, so it's it, it, that is a topic that is close to my heart, I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we should try to look at a few of the other questions that are coming in. Or... Yes, absolutely. I would just comment to what you said, though, is that uh, one interesting Bible verse that many people don't often look at, and it was pointed out to me by Cal DeWitt, who's an ecologist who wrote a book called Earthwise about creation care many years ago. He comes from more of a reformed tradition, so he, that, that tradition is more about the, the world being restored by us. But he, he pointed out that verse in Revelation where it says, God will destroy those who destroy the earth. <laughs> so, so another common argument is that humans don't have agency over the earth, and that's absolutely ridiculous. All you have to do, I mean, so are you denying? That, that nuclear war could destroy human civilization. So, so God cares about what happens to this planet. And as Christians, I think we do have an important role here and now. All right, let's take some of the questions. These are great questions. Yes, I'm trying to look at uh, my list. Um, okay, I've got them here. All right. If you what? click on top there, Peter, you'll see. The yeah, I've got that. In order. Okay. And I, I might as well start with the one that's on top. Do you have any tips for talking to Christians that are also climate change deniers? I can. I guess that deny that that ties in a little bit with what we're we've been discussing already. Well, um, I live in the second most conservative city in the entire United States right now. The most conservative city is Provo, Utah, where people are all Mormons. And then I live in Lubbock, Texas, um, where there's probably more churches per capita, I think, than almost anywhere else. And most people here, not all, and things are definitely changing, but especially when I first moved here more than 10 years ago, most people who call themselves Christians would reject the idea that climate is changing. Here's the thing, though. It's really important to recognize that people are not just either believers or deniers. And I actually have a problem with both of those words. I have a problem with believers because that implies that climate change is a religion of some type. And the Bible actually says that, that faith is the evidence of what we do not see. So by definition, if I had been there when the author of Hebrews was writing Hebrews, I would have, you know, I would have said, hey, you forgot the second half of the verse. Science is the evidence of what we do see, what is here and now. So climate change is science. It's the evidence of what we do see here and now. So I don't like calling it belief or believers because it pits it as this false religion that's in con conflict with Christianity, whereas in fact, it's just looking at what God's creation tells us. And then I don't like the word deniers because it's often a word that basically just draws a line in the sand and immediately starts an argument over a fight. What I prefer is I prefer a concept that's known as um, uh, the, the six Americas. So I'm actually going to try to find this here for you um, so I can show you what it looks like, because I think it's very, very um, uh, clear when you look at the diagram. Just a second here. Let me get it up on the screen. There we go. And if you don't mind now sharing my screen so everybody can see it. Can you see this now, Peter? Yes. Okay. So this is only for the United States, but this is really the case in, in almost every other rich country that we've looked at, where it turns out the majority of people are already either alarmed or concerned about climate change. But then in the US, where the US numbers are probably some of the highest in the world in terms of people who don't agree with the science, the US and Australia probably are number one and two, 20% of people are cautious. And what I've found is that cautious people usually lead with their doubts. So many cautious people are wrongly labeled as deniers because they lead with what they've heard and they're willing to engage. But if they just get shut down by being called a denier, then they just say, oh, well, those people don't want to talk about it. Then we've got 7% who are disengaged, 11% who are doubtful. And then we've only got 7% who are dismissive, just 7%. So now you can take it off screen sharing. Now, the 7%, how I define dismissive, is somebody who will dismiss everything and everything. 
If an angel from God with brand new tablets of stone saying global warming is real and foot high letters of flame appeared to a dismissive person, they would still dismiss it. And many of us know somebody who's dismissive. I have an uncle. My friend has a father. Dismissive people, it's part of their identity to reject climate change. And you know somebody's dismissive because they'll talk about it a lot. They'll bring it up frequently. They also are often Brexit. There's a strong correlation between Brexit and climate denial. And I don't think there's any positive way to talk to somebody who's dismissive other than saying, as I said to my friend Liz, when she texted me after arguing with her father for the 200th time, as I said to my friend Liz, I think you just have to say, dad, you're wrong, but I love you anyways. And I don't think we can talk about this anymore. But here's the thing. Over 90% of people in the U.S., and even more in Ireland and the UK, they're not dismissive. And for them, there is a secret. And the secret to talking to them is this, and this is what my TED talk is all about. The secret is begin with something that you agree on. Don't begin with something you disagree on. Because if you begin with something you disagree on immediately, you're butting heads. Begin with something you agree on, like your shared faith, for example, or you could both be hikers, or you could both fish, or you could both be parents, or you could both um, enjoy skiing, or you could both be, you know, something that you, you share with them. And then from the heart, not the head, from the heart, connect the dots to why you as a Christian, as a parent, as a birder or a hiker, why you care about climate change. And so they might too for the same reasons. And in my TED Talk, I won't give you the story, but in my TED Talk, there's a story about how I did this with people from the Rotary Club, and it tells you a lot more about how it works and how you can do it too. So give my TED Talk a watch. And remember, if they're the 7% who are dismissive, just say, I love you, and we can't talk about this anymore. But if they're anybody else, this absolutely does work, even if they're cautious or dismissive, or sorry, cautious or doubtful. Okay, I have a couple of other questions here. There's one that uh, that I think is quite interesting. And uh, so here the question is, N.T. Wright, who is a very well-known theologian in the UK, yeah. N.T. Wright speaks not about a transit to heaven, but the coming fusion of heaven and earth. Does having a view of a new earth help value the physical creation? Of course, this is a question mm -hmm that strongly links with our perspective on eschatology. I, I think it does. And I think that it's, there's no, it's no accident that some of the earliest thinking on creation care and the theology of caring for the earth came out of the Reformed tradition. But here's the thing. If we, want, if we wait to get everybody on the same page theologically before we fix issues of pollution and habitat destruction, deforestation, biodiversity loss, and climate change, if we wait until we get everybody on the same page theologically before we do that, that's never going to happen. Nobody's been on the same page theologically since the day, <laughs> since Jesus. <laughs> I mean, all of the books in the New Testament talk about divisions in the church that happen within years or even just years of that church being planted. So, so yes, that absolutely does help. But we have to show that there are overarching principles that we do all agree on that are sufficient to care about these things without having to feel like everybody has to be on the same page as us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Here's another uh, very practical uh, question. Do you have examples of congregations that have taken climate change seriously and responded in inspiring ways? Oh, I do. I love that question. Um, so I mentioned Colby May, who works in the US, unfortunately, but there's also programs in the UK and maybe in Ireland as well um, that do energy audits of churches to reduce their energy use, save money, and also reduce their carbon emissions. And then there's churches who have been an example of showing people what you can do, like looking at what it looks like to plant a community garden and grow local vegetables, or making sure that there is bike racks and ways for people to commute that don't involve driving, or looking at electric vehicles and even getting one to park in the parking lot that people can see. I spoke to a woman who works for Gloucester Cathedral, and she, she told me how much work it was to get the building permits to put solar panels on a thousand-year-old cathedral but they did it and now they actually have the tracking on on the church, church website so you can see how much solar energy they're producing 
But it's not only about cutting our own emissions, it's about talking about it. And so there are incredible organizations like Interfaith Power and Light that have um, sermon examples that you can use. There's organizations like Arasha, again, that restores ecosystems and works with people to, uh, to help people appreciate and understand this, this planet that we live on. There's organizations that like Tear Fund that churches can support, that they can contact for more information so that people can tell them firsthand stories of working with people in different countries around the world and how they've been able to help them prepare for the impacts of a changing climate. Um, and there's people who have formed creation care teams on their church to see how they can talk about it and do more in their local community. There's churches that have reached out into the community to look at people who are already poor and vulnerable and marginalized who are living in their community and see how they can help people in that community because those are the people who are most affected by climate change already. And some of them may be neighbors of your church. So I've seen so many examples. I love that question. And I feel like I should start collecting the examples or something like that. But what I do have on my website is I have a list of frequently asked questions. And uh, don't share my screen yet, but I'll just get those questions up so you can see. I do have a list of frequently asked questions. And one of the frequently asked questions I get is, what can my church do about climate change? So what I have done is I've tried to create kind of a list of ideas. And I'm not an expert, but I try to collect ideas. So um, just a second here, let me make this full screen. Okay, you can share my screen now. And on, under about solutions on my website, which is just my name, katherinehayhoe.com, I have my church wants to take action on climate change, where should I start? And if you go there, you will see that I have all kinds of links to both UK, European and North American organizations, cool congregations, eco church, eco congregations, the World Evangelical Alliance's Creation Care Force, the World Council of Churches Care for Creation and Climate Justice, the Big Church Switch, which is a UK program. And I've got all kinds of ideas of what a church can do. So please go to my website, katherinehayhoe.com and check out this list and some of the links because they're really fantastic. All right, you can stop sharing my screen now. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm, I'm conscious that uh, time is uh, running on. We're slightly over an hour, so shall we go to the last question? Sure. The I think this is a good question, so it's a nice one to close this off on. Uh, the, sorry, the question is, Catherine, as a Christian, where do you find hope today? Oh. Well, you know what? That... And the other question that was at the top of this list, how do you talk to people about this and where do you find hope are the number one and two questions I get no matter where I am, anywhere. And first of all, I think it's helpful to talk about where we don't find hope. We don't find much hope in the science. Every new study looks like it's worse than it was before. Greenland is melting faster. Uh, heat waves and storms are getting worse. Sea levels rising faster. And I don't find hope in politics. Often people will pin their hope on a specific leader and say, if this person gets elected, and there's an election coming up in the US very shortly, if this person gets elected, it will be okay. But if this person will get selected, it won't be. Well, no, no politician is a perfect fix either. I don't get my hope from the news. The news media, with the exception of, you know, the CBC and the BBC and, and, and national organizations, but the news media is largely for profit and they get their clicks from negative headlines. So that's not where I get my hope. Where I get my hope is from looking around and from hearing stories about what people are doing because people are doing tremendous things. I just wrote the foreword for a book that I'm so excited about. It's called Climate Courage by Andreas Karelis. And it's all about people who are doing things. When you look at what's actually happening, there's a tremendous amount happening, even in the United States. 50% of cities, states, companies, uh, corporations, uh, tribal nations, 50% are still in on the Paris Agreement, despite the position of the administration. I find my hope in looking at what other people are doing, but as a Christian, I think it goes even a level deeper. And in Romans, the Apostle Paul talks about hope, and he says that hope, and this is really counterintuitive, hope begins with suffering. And then suffering leads to perseverance, and perseverance leads to character, and character leads to a hope that will not disappoint because we haven't placed it in a specific leader, a specific policy, a specific action, a specific person. Our ultimate hope as Christians is placed in God, and that's why our hope will never fail. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to close this with a 
quick word of thanks. And first and foremost, we want to extend a very big thank you to Professor Catherine Hayo for delivering a very inspiring and engaging lecture on a really very important topic. She has a very busy schedule and we really appreciate that she's been willing to make the time, time available for this lecture. I want to big, extend a big thank you to all of you who have joined this live stream and also to those who will listen to this lecture at a future date. Mm. I want to thank Dr. Dean Venables at University College Cork, who has been on standby in case we would have internet problems, and especially to Steph Bevan in Cardiff. Steph mm. is the development officer of Christians in Science, and she has controlled the live stream to YouTube that you've been watching. So keep an eye out for future Walter lectures, which will be posted on our website. Goodbye and God bless.